going to make a kimono today out of silk. And I just wanted to show you how my sewing room is at the moment. I've got so many different lengths of fabric to make a kimono from. All these saris from India and Pakistan, there's Kanchipuram, there's Banarasi, all the different types. This is Thai silk, gold with a brocade. This is from Singapore, that is raw dupion. And this is the one I'm gonna be making. That's a Thai silk. This is Thai silk again, that's a brocade, same like the gold. I can't wait to use that. This is China silk, so fine habitai. It's absolutely beautiful, again from Thailand. And I've got that in three different colors. The black, I'm gonna mix with this, this sort of silver and black uh, hand-loomed Thai silk. But I'm going to start with this one. That is the one I've I've already cut a bit of it. I can't wait to use these two. They're so beautiful. Look at the way they shimmer. But I have to <laughs> I have to go with the the one I need to. Look at that gold. Is there anything more beautiful? So I've already cut this sort of partially, and I'm ready to make it. It's so lovely. It's hand loomed Thai silk as well. So it is so soft and it doesn't fall like a regular dupion. It isn't as sort of as structured as, as usual because it's, it's hand loomed and you can see there there's discoloration and little bits of ties where they've had to fix the threads in the loom where they've split. Um, and I've done half the cutting as you can see. So I showed you some of this threads, threading that I've done, the, the basting stitches. So I know where to go. First thing I need to do is cut the centre front open. Often I cut the whole thing and do the centre back as well, but this is narrow fabric, so I needed to leave the centre back together to take out one seam and take out the seam allowance that's involved with sewing a seam, just to give it that little bit of extra room for me to fit into it. Because you you would have seen my if you've seen my videos, you can see I'm I'm not the the trimmest person in the world and so I need all the help I can get when it comes to seams and if I can omit one I can it's something that I'll always do when I make kimono and yukata I use this method which is turning back so what I'm essentially doing is trying to mimic the tan mono the the 12 meter 13 yard length of fabric that you buy when you buy traditional Japanese fabric to make a traditional Japanese garment and what that has is a selvage on each side it is only 16 inches wide 40 centimeters and there's a selvage on each side so there isn't finishing when you get to the to the seams if you don't want you don't have to enclose a raw edge for example and so what I do here is I turn it over and you'll see I'm only just doing it by a tiny little bit. I think it's under a centimeter, way less than half an inch. Um, because again, I'm talking about this is Thai fabric, so it's it it's quite narrow, and I'm trying to save the 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 amount of seam allowance I use wherever I can. And I fold that back, and then I sew it down just with a giant stitch, and quite roughly just run it through the machine because it's just holding that back and that becomes my seam allowance and I'm mimicking a selvage in that way by doing that and it just makes it so much easier when you get to actually making the garment it goes up in a, in a jiffy because you've done all your seam finishes before you start and so it actually makes it quite easy so I just run that through and secure that side down and notice I haven't done the other side, and that's because I'm using another technique for safe space, for not space saving, it's for extending the amount of fabric I have, so reducing seam allowance. And I'm gonna French seam those little pieces, the front overlaps, onto the garment later, so we'll see that. But it really does help with that. So this is what I call raw edge management. And I just go around the side of each piece and I run that little raw edge just over. So once it's then put into a seam and I press them back, so I press the seams open, butterfly them, 
you don't see the raw edge. The raw edge is underneath. And because the fabric is so narrow, and I am not narrow, I am only doing it once. Usually I would do it twice, so you can. there's no chance of ever seeing the raw edge, but because this fabric's so narrow, I'm only doing it once. So if you're aware of suiting and the way that you would finish the inside of a suit, there's something called the Hong Kong finish. So when you're using binding, the Hong Kong finish is the same idea. You don't flip it all the way under so there's no chance of ever seeing the raw edge because you're not going to see it. So they do they make suits quickly so they, they just fold it only once. And this is the kind of thing I'm going for here. And the fabric's so beautiful. I, I had to make this. And when I saw it in the in the I was in a shopping mall where I found this and I saw it and I thought I, j I have to make a kimono out of this fabric I don't care how narrow it is and if I can't buy enough I'm gonna I'm gonna do it and I end up finding enough of it it is so beautiful it was it's in a shopping center in Bangkok called Icon Siam so it was incredibly expensive because I'm buying it in a shopping center in the crafts section of what it's called Souk Siam so it's this big beautiful basement level of, of the biggest shopping center in Bangkok this brand new thing it, it's it's the future and downstairs they have the souk which has little rivers running through it and there's little teak houses that are selling Thai sweets with gold leaf on them it's an absolute dream if you're in Bangkok go to Icon Siam everyone goes to Siam Paragon near MBK but go out to Icon Siam it's over on the river near the Hilton and it is so beautiful and they have a little fabric store there so I'm paying as much as I possibly could I think for this silk unless I'd bought it in London <laughs> I don't think I could have paid more and it is but it's so lovely I was eating a roti so a, a Thai flatbread that's covered in condensed milk I was sitting there eating that and I saw the fabric store I was so excited so I ran across and I bought a couple of different bolts of fabric there it's been an absolute fortune and right now, so I'm pressing it, you can see, and the steam rising out of it. Now, I don't know if it's this silk or it's because of where I bought it, but I swear it smells like chocolate. When you run the iron across it, it's like there is this sweet chocolate scent coming up. It was the nicest thing to press. And you'll see I press this a lot, probably more than I should because I just wanted to smell that chocolate again. It, it Kind of chocolate, kind of sweet. I, I swear it smelled like the... The roti stand I was at that made you know Milo and and hot chocolate and it made chocolate rotis and rotis with banana and Nutella all this stuff and it's it's just next to it so perhaps it's infused by that and what a great idea infuse your fabric with the scent of chocolate people it's <laughs> it's a dream to sew and it's quite nice it doesn't really smell like it when I put it on now but but I, I think just my memory of it makes me smile and makes me think of chocolate. <laughs> it was fantastic. But what a great place. And if you're in Bangkok, you should go to Icon Sam just to, just to marvel at, at the future that, that people live in, in in East Asia. They really do. They are, they are miles ahead and it's, it's becoming more and more apparent whenever you're there. Oh, it's fantastic. And so then in the bowels of this edifice to modern consumerism and capitalism right down in the bowels i'm sat there on a tiny little stool eating this pancake and there is the most beautiful hand loom you can tell it's hand loom just the way that you can see the hand of it as as i move it around on the ironing board but also you can see the way it's made and there's so many so many imperfections to it that that's what happens with a hand loom especially I don't know if you'll see it because they're so thin, but they're where the, where the thread breaks during the looming process, you tie it back together to to keep the looming going. And on this, they've got this sort of aubergine coloured silk, and part of it is a is a sort of silvery beige. But to tie the threads together, they used really thin red, red as you like silk red as a traffic light and so every once in a while there's just this tiny little knot that's in in bright red oh it's so beautiful that's the kind of stuff i love i love that in japan you'd call that wabi sabi the the beauty and imperfection and and but also you're seeing the craft if you can someone has come along and with their hands they've tied that little tiny knot 
with the thinnest piece of silk you could ever see. So I, I love things like that. And it does make the fabric different. It, I've got other Dupion kimono that I've made. So Dupion is, is this sort of thick slubby fabric that has a rib texture because the fabric's really thick. The, the threads are really thick in the warp. In the, in the weft, I'm sorry, the weft, weft to right, warp a long way. That's how you remember that. And so it's got this ribbed effect because then the warp fibers, so the ones that go all the way down the fabric, they're really thin. So so a lot of the time, if you buy a Dupion, you can almost fold it like, I, I want to say like a, an accordion, but you know that cardboard that has that ribbed effect on the back? It's almost like that. You could lift it like a blind if you hold it the right way. And usually that makes it really stiff and really structured. So if you put it on a mannequin, it would be like a scarecrow. But this one falls like crepe de chine from the from the get go. This has just been made and it already falls like that. So I, it, it's just the most sumptuous stuff I've ever bought. Absolutely love it. I don't regret any of the cost. It was fantastic. There's my collar. So this is all the preparation now. I always do this before I start. I do the raw edge management. I press the collar. I put the Tomo Airy, the little collars guard on top of it. Press the collar and then that's all done. So now this is, this is garment construction. Everything else then was prep. And now I'm actually getting pieces of fabric and sewing them together. Things are coming together now. So I'm gonna put these, are called the Akumi the front overlap they make an overlap for the garment so it overlaps in front like a double-breasted jacket if you think of that it's it's what makes the garment wrap around you and when I sometimes I talk about how you get the right size for these I never I always say you never subtract from the fabric you always adjust the seams you don't go in and cut a, a kimono and and cut it smaller because you're smaller you cut it exactly the same width all the time and then you adjust the seams that's what you do in Japan all the fabric comes at a, the same width of sort of around 16 inches around 40 centimeters and I really do mean around it goes up and down by an inch and, and, a, and a couple of centimeters easily and if you put when I put the body parts together so there's there's two pieces that make up the body and they have a front and a back but they're one piece each and but they join up and it looks there's sort of four quadrants and the four of them if you sew it in this way if you sew it in this way can be up to 140 centimeters around which is 50 five inches so that's for the widest part of the body you can see in this when i go up to the sewing when i go to the ironing board that i i can quite easily feel that i don't actually easily feel that i'm i'm a lot less than that but it means that if you're bigger than me if you're watching this and you're bigger than me you'll still fit into this kimono and you're not having to buy extra fabric or anything it goes up to about i think a us size 24. you can make it with any fabric by cutting it in this way is absolutely fabulous it, it, it's a universal garment in Japan and it is universal out here you do have to be a bit more you do have to be a bit more considered when you're making it bigger for when I went to Japan <laughs> when I first went to Japan I walked into the kimono shops I was so excited I'm like oh my god all the second-hand kimono stores and I walked in and I'm like oh I can't wait to buy a kimono and they, every single one I went in, they just went, oh, we have nothing for you. We have nothing that could fit you <laughs> with the shock. And I was like, oh no. And I, I, I buy kimono, I buy a traditional Japanese kimono and yukata and I buy vintage ones. And the only reason I buy them is because they are, they are heartbreakingly beautiful. I don't buy them because I want to wear them because I can't, they're too small for me. And so I went out and I started making them myself. And, and I found a way to make them for myself and get them as close to the actual garment from Japan that they could be, but they can fit me and they can fit someone who's a little bit larger. And of course, if you're smaller, you just make the seams larger. So, you know, everything's fine. You, you make it exactly as you would in Japan. 
the seams are huge in Japan, the seam allowances. But if you're a little larger, there is there's there's a way to do it, and and I've worked it out because <laughs> I had to. <laughs> they they just they literally said we have nothing for you. <laughs> it was quite funny. I didn't mind it, and I wasn't able to find the place where they sell the sumo fabric. I will on my on another trip. I'm going to find that, and I'm going to buy some and be able to make it. And I did find some actual Japanese fabric. I've got quite a few bolts of it. And if I sew it myself, I can make it for my size because you're basically ending up with what you can see right here, these long strips of fabric. And if you buy the actual fabric, you can make it yourself. But if you're trying to buy a garment and it's already seamed, unless you're going to remake it yourself, it might not fit you if you're as large as me and I'm quite large or larger you can see here this is the this is the French seam so the, I'm doing a really tight French seam you can see here I'm doing the proper thing trimming away all the little hairs after the first pass and then you come back you obviously press it back and then go go over it again this is a great way for saving fabric as well because you can make a French seam a lot smaller than you can turn back and then seam depending on your proficiency in a French seam I was taught how to do French seams the French way so oh they honestly they were we did three millimeters I don't know I think that's an eighth of an inch in Imperial I don't know what it even is in Imperial but we, and it had to be perfect and we did it with silk that slipped everywhere on industrial machines that went a hundred miles an hour so I, I'm quite comfortable doing French seam if you're not you carry on and turn back the seams and, and do them that way but a French seam is a great way to do it um, but only on this part you can't do it on the side seams because of the Miyatsuguchi and the way that the sleeves attach to the body so you can only use it on these front extensions I learnt that the hard way as well I do did like the garment here that you can see I'm wearing that paisley um, up at the ironing board that has French seams down the side seams but it means that it gets a bit twisted when you get up to the to the sleeves. Isn't that looking absolutely beautiful though? Look at this Earcat design as well. So Earcat, in case anyone out there is wondering, this is a tie-dyed Earcat, and I can tell that because of the way that the on those lighter bits you can see that it fades into the darker purple and crimsony color. ICAD is made by resist dyeing yarn before it's turned into fabric. So you get all your yarn and in some way you resist the yarn to dye in parts of it. So you might tie it up. In Japan there's shibori. They can do that to actual threads as well where you tie around it loads and loads and it means that the dye won't get into that part but it will get into other parts and you can do it with a paste, you can do it with all kinds of different things. And then what happens is the thread is then put onto the loom and it's very in a very certain way so the pattern comes through once the looming starts. Rather than say having uh, just plain fabric and then putting a resist onto the fabric to then dye the rest of the fabric. So it's that's tie dyeing or sibori or resist dyeing. This is ikat, so it's done before the fabric is loomed rather than afterwards. And it is absolutely beautiful. It's so nice. Look at this. Look at all the imperfections. There's so many of these white stripes coming through as well. It reminds me of lights on a road at night when it's raining. You know, like on the street where all the lights pull and they they sort of sift down into the water and it, they, they extend all the way down. That's what it reminds me of of a city at night in the rain. And there's the French seams. Aren't they beautiful? Lovely there. And because I don't have as much fabric, I'm not lining. I, I've done things like this and I've lined everything up perfectly, but I couldn't because there was enough fabric. So you just make it. And you can see here, there's like just a little bit of the design peeking through at that seam. That's absolutely fine. If you want, you can get right into it. You need to buy extra fabric if you're going to do all your seam matching. 
and make the pattern absolutely perfect throughout but I think this whole garment is about that imperfection and stuff doesn't line up and things things are a bit skew if even the seam is on a curve because because nothing on this thing is straight it's you're putting straight seams in but not really it's it's um it's got that rustic feel oh i love it so much i bought this in in that souk and so i've been watching shows and and lectures about the ayutthaya period so about 500 years ago if you think um around the tudor times in England or the Ming Dynasty going into the Qing Dynasty in uh, in China and coming up to the to the Edo period in Japan and that's the the time of the Ayutthaya Kingdom which is just this flowering of culture and, and sophistication in Thailand just not that far up from Bangkok I, at the end of their period the capital was moved to Bangkok and that's when um, Siam and, and Bangkok starts. But in the Ayutthaya period, they had an embassy from Japan. They had their own little island and everything that was trading. They, you know, they trade silk and rice and all kinds of things back then. And I could just, I can sort of picture this. You can imagine there's a imagine a Japanese person, part of the embassy, and they found someone along the Mekong is is making this. Um, this fabric and they go oh I'm gonna make a kimono out of that and it could have happened this could have happened I'm not sure if it did and I'm sure there's people who are in universities researching that could tell me whether or not that is true but I can imagine it. I can imagine a Japanese a Japanese person maybe a merchant or a diplomat who would have seen the beautiful Thai fabric and going I'm gonna make myself a kimono out of that at that time um, so that that's where I where my fantasy goes is that this is a 500 year old kimono that was that was made by by world trade and the globalism of the medieval period I, find, I love things like that, I find it fascinating and now look here it is sitting above the skyline of Manchester so it's made all the way around the globe So the collar is on. Collar is the hardest part. It takes the longest time. And uh, so now that that's on, it goes up in a second. You're just whipping a couple of sleeves on and then you're whipping the side seams, close the sleeves and do a hem. And that's that's the kimono made, essentially. It's so much fun. One, the collar, I always say the collar takes me, it takes me as long to put the collar onto the garment as it does to sew the entire garment. So it's its own thing altogether, and I get better at it every time. I get better at pinning the the collar to the garment. I get better at folding in all the excess into the collar, and I get better at actually sewing the collar around every single time I do it, and I'm getting better and better. I've made quite a few of these garments now, so I can, I'm getting better. Although I've got to say, there wasn't much filming that happened during the making of that collar because my phone fell off the <laughs> my phone fell off the the camera mount where I, the way that I film it and then just after that happened the needle broke into the fabric and like literally into the fabric it broke and then went horizontally into the, into these giant dupion threads so that day that day was a was not a happy day but <laughs> so so the filming stopped and I just sort of grunted and 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 went on and then the next day I came back and started doing the sleeves so that's why there's a little skip there because I wasn't having fun <laughs> sometimes that happens but then you know, you persevere and I, I came back I left it a few days I just I, I treated it like a you know I, I couldn't look at it I'm like you've you've let me down I cannot be around you for a while and for for four days I left this just sitting in the closet and I couldn't look at it and I did other things and now I came back to it and now I've finished it and it's amazing it oh it's such a beautiful garment it's so comfortable it's just lovely and it feels it feels like a part of the world it feels like a part of time because it, it just is it's I bought this in Thailand and I made it with a Japanese style and I live in the UK 
at the moment, but I'm an Australian. It's it's everything. I, it's what I love. I love global trade and history. They're my two favourite things. So that's why I love the kimono. You see these the sleeves are going on, and here I talked about butterflying the sleeve allowances open. And that's why we can't French seam the side seam. And that's why, because you have to butterfly this open because it has to pass across something called the Miyatsu Gucci. Now, it doesn't have to pass across Miyatsu Gucci. These have quite, this one has quite short sleeves, as in they're not, I'd say short, but I could also mean wide, as in the amount that they hang down from the wrist as the kimono sleeve. And when they're shorter, you don't need to have a Miyatsu Gucci, which is a split underneath the arm where the arm where the sleeve meets the side seam. A Miyatsu Gucci is a split between those two things and it sits open and it's used so you can get into the garment when you're putting on the garment with the traditional obi and you need lots of ties and things underneath. But it also helps with the sleeve pulling because of the sleeve's weight because it's so heavy pulling on the side seam and pulling on the neck and if the sleeves are shorter you don't need one so technically I think I could have come up here with a with a with a French seam and done it but I'm so used to doing it this way now that I think it's actually easier and if you're tired and doing French seams especially with a fabric like this this hasn't this doesn't really have a wrong side and a right side they're identical but you can really mess up because a French seam you have to do wrong sides together and then press and then you do right sides together and it's very easy to mess up it's <laughs> very easy to get wrong especially when you don't have definite sides you know this isn't a, a sublimated fabric which means that it's printed upon and so one side is is sort of see-through or you know one side doesn't have the print and the other side definitely does this is either side could be either way but you've treated the fabric in a certain way so so you have to have your wits about you. And it's actually easier to turn back the raw edge and then run up with just a regular um, stitch and then press it open. Yes, yeah, so I'm not doing a Miyatsu Gucci here, but I have stopped about an inch below where the sleeve meets the body. So it's gonna seem like you're gonna have a hole there and you are, but, it, but it's good. It just releases tension because otherwise you've got one, two, three, I think you've got six different, there'll be six layers up under your arm if you go all the way up to it. So always just stay away your, from where your sleeve meets the body to the side seam. Give it some room and it won't pull as much. A lot of people have that problem when they first make kimono is that they've got this pull that goes up from the underarm straight up to the neck. So if you can picture that going straight up like a line up to the neck and it, it looks skew with and it's a bit funny and that can either be done, that can be because the collar's put on without cutting into the collar like I did before to, to ease the fabric as you go around that turn or it's because you've sewn right up to your, um, to your sleeve seam and you, you need to leave it spaced. It's a, a lot of things when you're making a kimono is back to front or upside down from what you've learned if you sew regular things like I learned how to sew you know jeans and business shirts and dresses and all that kind of stuff and using butterick patterns and Vogue patterns and everything like that and then I came to this and you do a lot of stuff differently and you're closing all edges before you've made the garment you're uh, doing prep for pieces that are inserted after you've started something else there's a lot of upside down and back to front and it's what makes it fun it, it makes it different and makes it interesting it's it really is a fun thing to make and you can make it out of anything you know just clipping those huge slubby threads out and they start to fall out of the fabric after all the handling down at the hem and they're so thick it's like rope some of them and then it will just be the finest filament ever it's look at the you can see the the fraying down the bottom which is okay it's all even so that's good because I double checked coming up that side seam I'm so excited because now you've done that 
and you've got a full garment now, your garment is closed. The side seam is done, I've actually got the full garment. Everything is in the garment already, all the pattern pieces. There are only eight, two sleeves, two body, two overlaps, and two pieces for the collar. And if you are using Thai fabric, I, I might do, I'll do another video on it. I'll make it this week and I'll do a video on it. Because if you're using really narrow fabric, you can omit one of the collars because there isn't as much fabric. I'll do that. I will do that with one of those gold fabrics this week. And I'll, um, I'll get that up for you. Because, well, you might be going to Bangkok right now after seeing this and seeing how exciting it can be. <laughs> so I'm just closing the sleeves here. And you can see that that's the bottom of the fabric, those little stitches there. Or the top, the, it was a piece of fabric that I, that I had. I had the very last piece of fabric and this is just the end um, once they've finished looming. That's those stitches from there. So I, I kept them, I think they're absolutely beautiful. And here I turn around, this is the opening of the cuff. So I came up to where the cuff opening is, then I turn around and stitched back. So, cause that's a very high stress area that falls apart a lot. I'm constantly, because they catch on the doorway in my house, I'm constantly putting it under the sewing machine and re-sewing the side of the, of the sleeve up to the cuff um, back together because <laughs> cause I've run through, a, run through a doorway and caught it on the, on the, on the <laughs> caught it on the door handle. And usually I'm holding a cup of tea when that happens. So the walls here are, are getting very stained, unfortunately. Here you go. So this is, so I turned back the side of the rest of the garment. Remember, I did that. I left this for now. This is really easy to do now. This is the cuff, so I'm turning it once, but the cuff I'll turn twice, just because it's where your hand comes through. So I'm talking about, you know, it's going to catch on the door if you're not careful and things. But also, if it isn't turned back twice, when you go through, you'll you sort of flick. I'm doing it now with the garment I'm wearing. You'll, you'll flick the that little turnover and you might push that back out. So you see here, I've just turned it once again, very small, just to keep that nice and neat and you want that nice and tight. This is a very high use, high stress area of the garment. So you have to make sure it's nice and secure. And if you're like me, you're gonna have to re-sew that anyway another day because you've, you've dashed to get a delivery order and <laughs> and pulled your garment apart but at least the cuff will be nice oh look at that when the, when the sleeve presses it's so beautiful and it's this beautiful square wow there's that cuff keeping it nice and nice and flat and it's being top stitched down so I to it's top stitched so I sew it from the outside down onto it Throughout this whole process, I use the highest stitch possible. So on my machine, it's five millimeters, which is, I think, an eighth of an inch or maybe a quarter of an inch. But for the whole thing, I used the largest stitch because nothing needs to be stitched down with a tiny stitch. So use a large stitch. It means that your fabric might gather a bit more, but you just have to sort of pull it out once you've done it. But it also means that, because they're such huge pattern pieces, the sewing will go quicker because the stitch is larger. So that helps. Oh, we're ready to hem. Here we go. Home stretch this is. Because I've done everything beforehand, all I have to do is do this and press it. And we are finished. Look at that hem, isn't that beautiful? See those open seams there as I pass across them? Isn't that fabric it is so beautiful i wore this garment all day today the garment i'm wearing in the video right now that paisley i had that on and it got really cold because it's now winter and so i put that one on on top and it was such a comfortable outfit with what i'm wearing here underneath as well so i've got three layers i've got cotton t-shirt a uh, cotton lawn yukata on top of that and then i've got a silk kimono on top of that and I also felt very regal. So if you can inject some of that into your life, then you're doing well. <laughs> it's always nice to feel regal when you aren't. <laughs> oh, doesn't that look lovely? A lovely crisp hem. Is there anything better? Honestly, 
Um, I am a ham and a seam nerd, but I think everyone can agree that we love we love a good ham. Marvelous! Look at that. I press the. That's called the shoulder mountain mat. The katayama and the sodayama. Shoulder mountain and the sleeve mountain. It's the peak, the crisp peak that you put into the top of the sleeve there. You can see it just there. Oh, isn't that gorgeous? Do you see how it drapes? You wouldn't think it would drape so smoothly. I hope you like this. Isn't that fabulous? Go and make your own. <laughs> it's so much fun.